Let's continue the discussion of AI and great power competition, in particular with China. By way of background, I studied Latin and Greek at a small liberal arts college in Maine, found my way into the Foreign Service, studied Mandarin, and spent most of the 90s in greater China. I became enthralled with the US-China problem set. Uh, Indo-PACOM is my AOR and it's personal. After the Foreign Service, I moved to the private sector and I've really dedicated my time and my career to trying to help the US address problems of consequence at the nexus of national security and technology. So let's dive in. I chose to present AI great power competition elements as a tangram. First, because the Tangram seven polygon puzzle, which is a dissection puzzle, originated in China. The Chinese here is Qi Chao Ban, or seven tiles of skill. But more importantly, I chose a Tangram because what seems like a straightforward, self-contained problem set with geometric boundaries actually represents a myriad of options. From a confused set of broken shards to artfully arranged images for the skilled visionary. We'll get back to AI shortly, but first, let's turn to the current US-China dynamic. I encourage you to listen to Admiral Aquilino's recent interview summarizing his tenure at Indo-PACOM and the challenges ahead for Admiral Paparo. There have been many times in recent decades when US-China relations have reached or felt acute pressure. I remember, for example, in 1999, the accidental bombing of the PRC embassy in Belgrade as an example. But back then, there existed a buffer layer of goodwill and robust bilateral comms and mutual economic benefit. Today, however, that layer of goodwill has eroded so that acute events bring even greater risk of, it, of, of escalation and problems. This is very serious, and in my view, AI is central to this problem. To appreciate how much has changed, let's rewind to Beijing 1994, almost 30 years to the date. Yes, it was VCRs and dial-up back then. Okay, so I'm riding my bike around Zhongguansun. That's the birthplace of China's tech boom. I want you to picture the intellectual energy of Cambridge, the entrepreneurship of Silicon Valley, maybe a little bit of Tyson's Corner thrown in there to a very small, compressed, not so modern district of Northwestern Beijing. This was the dawn of a new era. It was just five years since Tiananmen Square, yet the US approves most favored nation trading status and the doors to direct investment and tech investment are thrown wide open. Microsoft, IBM, and others all lean in. And there's one report that says that at the peak, US technology dominated and penetrated the market to 80%. And Chinese entrepreneurs also uh, benefited greatly. I remember one young Beida grad who had coded an overlay app to English language Microsoft Word so that you could use Word in Chinese. It was brilliant. Right, and it drove demand for US product and it launched him on a career that would bring him to the next level. This is just a small example of what grew to be the juggernaut of the China tech boom. There were plenty of challenges, but the relationship had momentum and common interests always seemed to carry the day. I wish we had more time to talk about the intervening decades, but we need to leave the halcyon days of the 1990s and get back to 2024 and the current relationship. So jump back on that flying pigeon bike and ride back to present day 2024. Okay, these are very tense times. How did we get here? Right now we're in a tit for tat policy situation. We were absolutely justified and right about our concerns about Huawei, so we took action. Then China bans Micron, calls out two of our best aerospace defense enterprises. They restrict gallium and germanium. We clamp, clamp down on GPU exports and force a TikTok sale. Same situation on the policy front. We passed the China and Science, uh, sorry, the Chips and the uh, Science Act, investing billions in US-based chip manufacturing, while China has adopted the IT Innovation, or Xinchuang Plan, which reportedly requires 100% full domestication of the Chinese IT stack by 2027. Also contributing to Sino-US tensions are legitimate domestic policy concerns related to the loss of US manufacturing jobs. 
But the point is, is in the 90s, tech investment and bilateral trade mitigated tensions. Today, control of tech investment and trade restrictions serve as an accelerant for an already inflamed relationship. All of this begs the question, was Wired the first one where they get it right in 2018 when they presaged an AI Cold War? History has taught us that world powers like to own the entire value chain. Best timber for masts, uh, control the sea lanes, control the sugar trade, you get it. This is a basic value chain for AI, and currently I think we all agree that the US is meaningfully ahead. And I fundamentally believe, as you heard from Lieutenant General Skinner and from West, that AI will be instrumental in every aspect of national defense. But to me, the most impactful application of AI will involve battle planning, modeling, and execution. The national defense equation to me is very clear. AI superiority equals velocity superiority, decision velocity superiority. So yes, it's velocity, not just fast decisions, but forward decisions with positive gain. All right, let's look at this more closely. At SMX, we do a meaningful amount of work in C6, ISR, ops planning, and war gaming uh, modeling. We've had the privilege to support many DOD clients pretty far forward. And I think we're all thrilled with the doctrine that's been discussed today, where we're pushing data and decisions closer and closer to the edge. And I'm a firm believer in the soft truth that humans matter more than hardware. But in a radical AI future, there will be no time for decisions. The kill chain will be nearly instantaneous. In this future state, live updated wargaming models will run constantly at the speed of execution in sync at once, all on platforms at the edge. There will be no time for decisions. In fact, these large, massive, large language models will be tuned for action and commanders will hit play and refresh rather than making decisions. I'm talking about humans and combat systems everywhere, all the time, at once, executing autonomically. All right, let's come back to the Tangram and our original problem set. There are a couple of pathways. Are we on a countdown to confrontation? I believe that the battle for AI supremacy will continue to contribute to escalation of existing geopolitical tensions. The historical corollary might be oil here. It's worth maybe getting into a conflict to protect that source. Indeed, this quote from Ambassador Nate Fick is incisive. Tech is increasingly the entire game. But let's not end on such a somber note. The New York Times quotation here, it's just a couple weeks back, I think is very encouraging. It shows that we're willing to come together to build a bridge to talk about AI and its strategic value. On the downside, it does appear that we're already talking about AI as arms. So if the last tangram was an indication that AI was more like a resource like oil, in this case, we're treating AI more like nuclear arsenal. Interestingly, the subject of these talks is reportedly that they're gonna talk about committing not to use AI uh, in the context of nuclear command and control. And amen to that. If we think an automatic, uh, autonomically running model uh, to decide when, wish, whether we should use nuclear arms, it's a nightmare. So I think I worry too that because of this, senior leaders may shy away from using AI strategically for decision making because they'll say, oh, we have to keep the human in the loop. But if our adversary does use AI to achieve decision superiority, and we avoid it out of concern, then I fear that we'll fall behind and lose our lead. So as Cold Warish as it may sound, I firmly believe that we need to construct a bridge to engagement with the PRC, and at the same time, maintain our lead in the AR arms race. I'm very hopeful. Thank you for your time and attention, and I look forward to discussions later.